Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Do you ever have one of those days where you just kind of get carried away with things and you, you maybe just say one or two things you maybe you shouldn't say or do one of the two things you maybe you shouldn't do? <clears throat> to me, it's a lot like that scene in the original Ghostbusters movie, the one that was actually worth watching, uh, where they're talking to the mayor and, and Bill Murray starts talking about you know, fire and brimstone stuff, you know, dogs and cats living together. It's pretty clear he got carried away. Um, and I don't know how much of that was written into the script, how much of it was just Bill Murray extemporizing, but I thought it was hilarious. At any rate, people do get carried away, and that is certainly no less uh, true with regard to lawyers as it is to anybody else. And in the case we're going to talk about today, it basically is a set of plaintiff's lawyers who thought they'd found the mother load. And rather than just be satisfied with, the, with a plaintiff's verdict, they decided to, you know, go all the way for, you know, the gusto. And, and as a result, they went just more than just a little bit too far, as you'll see when we talk about the case. So today we're going to talk about the strange case of Dr. Durrani. Dr. Durrani is a, or was, a spine surgeon. He has lost his license to practice in the United States. He may very well be practicing over in Pakistan, I couldn't tell you. But the bottom line is he is a surgeon. He made, is alleged to have been making errors in his surgeries. And in this case, it's also alleged that he essentially defrauded the patient by giving him bad information to convince him to have surgery that he probably didn't need. So this is Dr. Durrani. Yes, that is an actual wanted poster. And yes, it's a current wanted poster. And that's because when Dr. Durrani was charged with fraud and creating uh, signed prescription pads that he handed out and over-prescribing opioids in many cases because he had performed very bad surgeries. Um, that was health care fraud and it was a crime and he was indicted. And the judge allowed him to go free on bond. Now, I don't know what the bond was that was set, but whatever it was, he doesn't have that money now because as soon as he got his bond, he jumped on a plane and flew home to Pakistan. Well, the problem with flying home to Pakistan for him is it may get him away from the feds who are trying to put him in jail, but it is absolutely not going to do a darn thing for him with respect to these medical negligence lawsuits because any tolling of the statute of limitations is stopped while he's out of the country. Now, you're probably wondering if he's still out of the country, how they could sue him. Well, more likely than not, the insurance company decided to accept service on his behalf so that they could gather up all of the cases against him and try and get them either settled or tried in, in one fell swoop. And that's why we're at the Ohio Court of Appeals here and why they were at the trial court, because... More likely than not, these lawyers are, for the doctor are being paid for by the insurance company, and they are trying to reduce as much as possible the amount of money that they might have to pay. It is a civil appeal, and it says this medical malpractice case was brought by plaintiff Patrick Stevenson, involves allegations of medical negligence related to four separate back surgeries performed by Dr. Durrani. The case proceeded to a jury trial and returned verdicts in favor of Mr. Stevenson. He was negligent, concluding that he was negligent in his care and treatment, failed to acquire informed consent, committed battery, and made fraudulent misrepresentations to Mr. Stevenson. However, the trial court abused its discretion in various evidentiary and trial-related rulings that, when viewed collectively, we cannot consider harmless. Accordingly, we must reverse the judgment and remand this matter for a new trial. So Stevenson was ejected from a car at the age of 12 years old, and he's now 54 and has suffered lingering back pain. In March of 2010, after his pain became next to unbearable, which he categorized as a 10 on a 10-point scale, one of his doctors referred him to Dr. Durrani. Thanks, Doc. 
Durrani assured Stevenson that he could fix him and he needed to undergo various surgeries, including a cervical neck surgery. Otherwise, his head would come off in a car accident. So Durrani doubled down, emphasizing if you're in an accident, you're going to end up with a broken neck and you're going to end up paralyzed. So these are the surgeries. He performed an L4, L5, L5, S1 axial, axial if, axial if surgery, which apparently eliminated the numbness and tingling in his legs and the pain down his buttocks. But the pain in his lower back remained. And he claims that the surgery caused him to suffer new pain in his mid-back and pain in his ribs. A second surgery at Westchester Hospital, a C5-C6 fusion, that's in the neck, apparently relieved his arm and shoulder pain and relieved a pinched nerve. Then he performed a T7 T to through T10 instrumental fusion, which is in the thoracic part of the chest or back, and he said he began to experience new pain on his right side after that surgery. Then Durrani performed a fourth and final surgery in November of 2012, which was a foraminectomy and a hemilaminectomy from C5 through C7, which are the cervical vertebrae in the neck. Although this apparently resolved his mid-back pain, Stevenson is apparently unable to work and cannot walk and believes that each surgery performed by Durrani was medically unnecessary, improperly performed, and lacked his informed consent. So Stevenson pursued claims against Dr. Durrani for negligence, battery, lack of informed consent, intentional infliction of emotional distress, fraud, and spoliation of evidence. Against Cast, Mr. Stevenson asserted claims for vicarious liability, negligent hiring, retention, and supervision, spoliation of evidence fraud and violation of the Ohio Consumer Sales Practices Act. So one of the things that's important with regard to informed consent is that you have to inform the patient. You have to give them the information that a reasonable person would need in order to decide whether to submit to surgery or not. So if you tell somebody if you don't have this surgery your head's going to fall off and there is no basis in medical fact for that statement, then what you have is not informed consent. You have misinformed consent or fraud. And as a result, that's why the issue comes up here because the, the consent issue is important and it's the failure to give good direction and tell the patient the truth about what the risks are that create the battery claim and the lack of informed consent claim. The jury found Dr. Durrani and Cast acted with actual malice or aggravated or egregious fraud towards Stevenson and were negligent and they awarded him $820,000 in total damages of which $525,000 was in punitive damages and attorney's fees. So the trial court reduced the punitive damages to $350,000 and applied a set-off of $87,378, reflecting the settlement that Mr. Stevenson had received from other defendants, lowering his damages to $732,635 and then awarded prejudgment interest. Now you notice here that they offset this judgment for $87,000 and change, and you wonder where that came from. Well, it probably came from Westchester Hospital, which was one of the hospitals involved in doing these surgeries. And it probably came from the insurance company of the hospital. So the other settlements are set off against the damages, and that lowers the damages. In other words, there's only one amount of money that is an accurate representation of this patient's damages. And if he's already gotten money from other people in a settlement, that needs to reduce the amount that he gets from the doctor. But it doesn't matter in the end because this is the judgment that is written here is going away. In their first assignment of error, defendants insist that Mr. Stevenson's claims to the first three surgeries are time barred. Generally in Ohio, medical malpractice claims are subject to a four-year statute of repose. The surgeries took place beginning in 2010 through 2012 and he commenced this action in 2016, more than four years after the first three surgeries. 
Defendants acknowledged, as they must, that Mr. Stevenson's claims against Durrani are told based on the absent defendant statute because he fled to Pakistan in 2013. And they quote Elliott versus Durrani, which is a first district case, because Durrani fled the country in December 2013, less than four years after plaintiff's surgery, the statute of repose is told and does not bar plaintiff's claims against Durrani. So they, they basically said, you get to sue Durrani, but the claims are different against CAST. That's the corporate entity. The analysis differs, however, regarding claims against CAST. The tolling provision applies only to claims against Durrani and not to claims against CAST. Mr. Stevenson tries to circumvent this holding in two ways. First, he argues waiver, that the defendants only broached this point in their answer to his amended complaint. This briefing represented a legitimate effort to pursue the statute of proposed defense and not a mere conclusory assertion that the affirmative defense should apply. So they didn't find that persuasive. And turning to the merits, the Secretary of State may have administratively canceled CAST in 2014 for failure to maintain an agent, but unlike Durrani, who fled the country, CAST stayed put, and as a result, with respect to the statute of repose, the statute does not bar any claims against Durrani, but the statute bars claims against CAST for the first three surgeries, but not the final surgery, which was less than four years before Stevenson commenced his actions. Given that we're remanding this cause for a new trial upon retrial, the case against CAST should be limited to claims pertaining to the fourth surgery. Obviously, the gestalt of the opinion here is the doctor can run and the doctor can hide, but he can't hide from the statute of limitations because the statute of limitations is told, meaning stopped, during the period of time when he's out of the country. And of course, he's still out of the country. But his organization, this Center for Advanced Spine Techniques, guess what? They are present. They were right there. They did not run. A corporation can't run. It's A corporation is an entity of the that's created in the state, and it's recognized by the state and regulated by the state. And as a result, it just can't, you know, without closing down and opening up somewhere else, it can't run. So when the when they didn't pursue the claims against CAST within the, the statute of limitations period, well, in that situation, you have a situation where, unfortunately, they lose their claims for the earlier surgeries. So the second assignment of error involves evidentiary issues. And in an evidentiary case, the court construes the evidence in the light most favorable to the trial court's ruling while applying an abuse of discretion standard. Abuse of discretion essentially means that the court's attitude was arbitrary, unreasonable, or unconscionable. We find some error, but not all, of defendants' claims, and we address all matters to provide guidance for retrial. After our discussion of the specific arguments below, we turn to a consideration of harmless error. And of course, harmless error says basically, yeah, the judge made a few errors here, but it wasn't enough to upset the balance, and on balance, the guy should have to pay damages. That's not going to happen here. I'm not going to bury the lead. Defendants initially seized on an ex parte contact between Mr. Stevenson and one of the jurors. And after the trial court admonished Mr. Stevenson, it asked the defense if they wanted to proceed. You know, defense counsel says, I want a mistrial. I don't know how you can repair that. And the court says, okay, look, I can, you know, we can see if there's some prejudice here. But you know, I certainly think requesting a mistrial is extreme at this point unless more than one juror was spoken to and unless more than what he said was said to them. So a defense counsel says, okay, well, let's move on the trial, move on with the trial. And the court said, look, this is your bite at the apple. You bite it or you don't at this point, because I know from this point forward, if Mr. Stevenson sees a juror, he's going to run the other way. And Mr. Stevenson said, yes, sir. So the only thing I would say by bringing a juror in and asking questions, you're certainly going to highlight to that juror at a minimum and probably to other jurors because they will know he's been called in. So defense counsel says, right, let's proceed with the trial without voir diring the jury, which means without asking them questions. So they discussed this. They said, you know, there's two problems with the mistrial argument. First, transcript shows you withdrew the request. 
and they were specifically rejected measures offered to them to establish prejudice. And as a result, the trial court provided options to defense counsel found lacking in MAC that would have enabled them to develop a record of prejudice. Without that record, we cannot conclude that the trial court abused its discretion in denying them his trial request, assuming that it was not withdrawn. But obviously it was. And here we have again uh, the obvious answer is if you do not ask for a mistrial, if you do not force the judge to make that call, then you lose out on any appellate error. If you don't give the judge a chance to correct the error and gather the information necessary to find out if there was prejudice, well, then you can't really convict the judge of error because uh, there was there was no evidence that the, the juror had been in any way affected by this ex parte contact. I have a funny story about an ex parte contact. One of my first adventures in the law as a solo practitioner was to defend a guy who had been accused of running a, uh, essentially he was running an escort service and he was providing uh, young ladies to people who uh, wanted to do things with them for money that was unlawful under the state of Missouri. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that. But this was a guy who was an angle shooter. He had an answer for everything. It wasn't a good answer, but he had an answer for everything. And so at the close of the jury selection on the very first day, I was conferring with the opposing counsel and I looked around and I said, where is our client? And she said, well, our, my paralegal said, well, he went that away. I said, well, go find him. Make sure he's, you know, going to be here tomorrow. I want to, you know, I want to find out what's going on with him. She ran downstairs and she found that he was holding the door and lighting the cigarettes of the jurors. Now, you can do a lot of things. You can, if you see a juror in the hallway, you can say hi, um, good morning, nice to see you, uh, but you can't engage in any substantive contact. And if you are a defendant, you certainly can't go out there and try and ingratiate yourself with the, uh, with the jurors in your case. And that's what he did. And the judge told him that if he wanted to spend the rest of the time in this trial in an orange jumpsuit instead of in that nice three-piece suit that he was wearing, well, then perhaps he ought to think about not doing anything that stupid again. And he didn't do anything that stupid, but he certainly made up for it in other ways. So next, the issue comes up with inadmissible habit evidence. And basically what's happening here is this is... Uh, this is rank hearsay being asserted as habit evidence. So Dr. Tayeb worked with this uh, Dr. Durrani and testified that patients had told him that the doctor had told them their heads would fall off. So now you have hearsay within hearsay. Dr. Tayeb is repeating what the patients are saying, and the patients are repeating what Dr. Durrani said. So if there is not a hearsay exception that would cover all of those statements, it's barred by the hearsay rule. But the plaintiffs, being smart plaintiffs and smart lawyers, said, oh, no, 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 this is habit, because uh, this was Dr. Durrani's habit to say these things. And, of course, the court looks at that and says the, that because the trial court analyzed it, we'll, we're going to analyze it. It's important to emphasize that Dr. Tayeb was treating the same patients as Dr. Durrani, and therefore he certainly observed their experiences as they came to him and sought treatment. So he has personal knowledge and he's allowed to testify, but the problem here is that Dr. Durrani's behavior does not constitute a habit, at least on the record presented to this court. To be admissible as a habit, the occurrence of the stimulus and responsive behavior must occur frequently enough to constitute a pattern. A sufficient foundation must be provided for the admission of the habit evidence. So here we don't see a proper foundation laid to establish the habit under the rule. And third, a habit should be reflexive and nearly automatic. We do not know from Dr. Tayeb's testimony whether Durrani always, typically, or just sometimes offered the warning about heads falling off and the like. And so this dovetails with the prior point, and as a result, they're going to say that the court should have excluded this information, and that's exactly 
what they say. On the record before us, the court abused its discretion in admitting Dr. Tayeb's testimony without a sufficient foundation for Dr. Durrani's alleged habitual response for the purpose of evidentiary rule 406. Once the court found that the claims against caste were barred, and once it reached this decision on the application of the habit testimony, it's pretty much a done deal that this case is going back. But in addition to that, the court found that mentioning other malpractice claims was evidentiary error, mentioning the fact that he lost his medical license, not because of malpractice, but because he had engaged in health care fraud. All of these things also were evidentiary errors, and the, as a, in the sum total, they simply could not be forgiven. We must now evaluate whether those errors are harmless or warrant a new trial. In determining whether substantial justice has been done, a reviewing court must weigh the prejudicial effects of the errors and determine whether the trier of fact would have reached the same conclusions had the errors not occurred. With the prejudicial impact largely self-evident, we must evaluate the significance of these errors against the remaining trial record, which they then go through in somewhat summary fashion. We have an individual with a nearly lifelong chronic back pain who acknowledges that Durrani achieved certain successes with his medical care. This renders the evidentiary record a much closer call on Durrani's liability than in some other cases that we have seen. And they cite one of those. Therefore, the three errors taken together in this present case cannot be dismissed as harmless. They were highly prejudicial, and we question whether the jury would have reached the same conclusion but for these errors. Defendants are accordingly entitled to a new trial in which the jury can consider the case afresh without the prejudicial evidence that intruded into the first trial. The second assignment of error is sustained. So, I don't know whether this was the judge's first day on the bench or his last, but he made a number of really serious errors here, and he was induced to make those errors by the arguments of counsel. And that's why when things are going especially good for you at trial, you need to step back and think, wow, did I just jump down the rabbit hole? Because if you get a lot of good evidence in and an appellate court later says, mm -mm -mm, no, sorry, don't get to do that. Well, it's the judge's error, but you're the one who's going to pay for it. And indeed, that's what happened in this case. So hopefully you found this interesting and helpful. And, uh, if not, I would still appreciate it if you would like the video and help me out with the algorithm. Thanks again for watching. Try and do something today to help fight a problem in your community. Maybe it's racism. Maybe it's hunger. Maybe it's just people who don't stop at red lights. Whatever it is, do something positive to help your community. It'll make the world a better place. Well, catch me down here at the beach next time, and we'll talk about something else interesting. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.